RIP VHS. The store will close as no buyer is found. They're shutting up shop with the loss of 11,000 jobs. Another famous high street name is to disappear. Also tonight, Merkel's warning to Britain, you're better off in than out. How neglect and staff shortages contributed to this teenager's death at a private hospital. And hard cash introducing the new, brand new, virtually indestructible fibre. This is the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Charlene White. Good evening. It looks like it's all over for BHS. No suitable buyer has been found, so another famous name is set to disappear from the high street. More significantly, 11,000 jobs will go with it. All 163 stores will close. Administrators blamed the failure on turbulent times, but there are serious questions over what role previous owners, including Sir Philip Green, played in its demise. Our business editor Joel Hills reports. At BHS headquarters in London, the redundancies are already underway. The emotions overwhelming. A five-week search for a buyer has ended in failure. This company was obviously in trouble, but for staff and customers, there's still a sense of shock. Obviously, everyone hoped for a positive outcome. Yeah, and everyone had been feeling positive, um, and everyone hoped that something good was going to come from it, but... BHS is running on fumes. The discounts have proved popular, the stores are well stocked, but the warehouses are running dry. This morning, when a bid fronted by Greg Tufnell, who briefly led Mothercare in the 1990s, failed to come up with money to complete a deal, time had run out. 8,000 people who are directly employed by BHS are set to lose their jobs as the business is gradually wound down over the next few months. A further 3,000 people employed in BHS's concessions and its canteens are also at risk of redundancy. In total, 163 stores will be closed as stock is sold off. There were people interested in saving BHS. In the last few weeks, there have been bids from Sports Direct, Pound Stretcher, Edinburgh Woolen Mill, Select Fashion. But at the end of the day, the administrator, Duffin Phelps, ultimately decided that BHS was worth more dead, essentially, than it was alive. Remember, the administrator has a legal obligation to raise as much money for creditors as possible. It is not obliged to save jobs. Sir Philip Green sold BHS a year ago for one pound. In a statement, he said he was saddened and disappointed. His Arcadia Group is still owed £35 million by BHS. He and other secured creditors are first in line for any money raised as the business is wound down. I'm concerned about 11,000 people whose jobs are being destroyed and 20,000 people who are either drawing or will be drawing a pension who've just been cast asunder. That's the concern. Closing time in Sheffield, but this store and all the others will reopen tomorrow. Winding this business down will take several weeks, but we've entered a final phase. So a very sad saga, this terrible news for all the staff. Is there any hope at all for their jobs? Well, I suppose so. I mean, it may well be that a, a new buyer emerges at this stage, Mark, and buys the brand and the stalls and some stock uh, from Duff and Phelps as it's being wound down. But I have to say, I mean, that would be nothing short of a miracle given what's happened over the last five weeks. BHS had some real challenges and I'm told that actually a buyer, the big problem was that a buyer had to come up with £100 million of funding to, pre, you know, to basically to trade over the next few weeks. So, you know, things were that bad. They had to re-establish credit lines with suppliers and order all that stock that was needed in the run-up to Christmas. So uh, at the end of the day, that was the, the sticking point here. But 11,000 jobs are, are in the process of being lost. I mean, that's an unimaginable number. Uh, and, and the bill, I mean, this is the other thing to bear in mind, the bill for all the redundancy payments that will be made uh, will come to, I'm told, around eight to 12 million pounds. That bill will be paid by the taxpayer. So there is, you know, Taxpayer interest at stake here as well. All right, Joel, thank you very much indeed. 
German Chancellor Angela Merkel waded into the UK's referendum debates today, warning Britain would only get a good deal if it stays in the EU. It's the most significant intervention yet by another European leader. But Vote Leave campaigners said it only suited German interests, not ours. Here's our deputy political editor, Chris Shipp. Morning, guys. It's not how you normally see the Prime Minister on a Thursday morning, but then for the purposes of winning this referendum, politicians, it seems, are prepared to boldly go where they don't often tread. At a bird sanctuary, he said the natural environment was better protected inside the EU, but while Mr Cameron was seeking support here, there was a helping hand for him in Berlin, where Europe's most powerful politician said as much as she's ever said about the UK's decision on the EU. In my experience, you will never get a really good deal on the single market when you are not in the room, involved in the discussions. Countries on the outside, we've had lots of talks with them, won't be able to get the same deal if they are not sharing the responsibilities and costs with us. In other words, life outside the single market will not be easy, says the leader who pulls the strings in Europe. Of course, she's absolutely right. If you're having negotiations about the future of Europe, and we are geographically and culturally part of Europe, we always have been for centuries, uh, thousands of years, if you're not there, you can't expect your views to be taken into account. 800 there, 800 there, 800 there, 800 again. We've already said politicians will do anything to win this referendum, so Boris Johnson was today... Contented cow. ...selling a cow. He didn't get any magic beans for this one. Going, going on. So, there you go. But he tried to sell to these farmers in Lancashire his plan to keep giving them subsidies if the UK votes to leave. As for Angela Merkel's intervention today, Mr Johnson said we don't get a great deal now when we're in the room. As for the argument that we'd be better off making these points from within the European Union, which is what Angela Merkel said, well, look at what happened during the negotiations. Uh, the government told the country that we'd make sure that people had to have a job before coming here, they got nowhere. They didn't get a sausage, they didn't get a, a saucy salt, they got nothing. There have now been warnings from the German and other EU leaders in recent days, but Leave campaigners still insist it's time to turn our backs on this European herd. Now, this is the most that Angela Merkel has said about our referendum since David Cameron renegotiated Britain's relationship with Europe way back in February. Why do we care what she says? Well, if we were to vote to leave, then Angela Merkel would have huge influence on the deal that we would get after Brexit. Now, throughout this campaign, uh, Leave campaigners like Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and others have said we'd be able perfectly to trade uh, with the single market. But here is Europe's most powerful politician saying, no, you won't, certainly not in the way you do now. Chris, thank you. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has been setting out his arguments for Britain remaining in the EU. There have been questions about whether his heart is really in it, but today he put what he called the positive case. He did, however, attack the Chancellor's prophecies of doom about leaving the EU. Our political correspondent Libby Vina reports from Tooting in London and how it all went down with Labour voters. On the same side, well, not exactly. But on Europe, Sadiq Khan, London's new mayor, appeared with David Cameron, while Ed Balls joined forces with his arch-rival, George Osborne. No such political cross-dressing for Jeremy Corbyn today, but he did urge voters to back staying in the EU and tackled vote leave head-on over immigration. More people living in an area can put real pressure on local services like doctors, schools and housing. That is not the fault of the migrants, it's the failure of government. But one former Labour donor insists he's a reluctant convert. I think Jeremy Corbyn's got a long record of being Eurosceptic and obviously he's under a lot of pressure from his colleagues in Parliament to adopt the same stance as they are. So what do voters in Tooting, where Sadiq Khan is now standing down as MP, make of Labour's campaign so far? Is Labour for leave or for remain? Um, I think uh, Labour to leave, I think. I think most to... of them are for remain, in fact, you'll find. Is it? They're for remain. I think Jeremy Corbyn is, is pro-Europe, isn't he? Well, I think he needs to be more visible, isn't it? Um, but um, if you're asking my opinion, I think uh, we should be in. Um, we want a Britain which is um, big on trade rather than a small 
corner shop. We don't want a corner shop economy. The kind of argument some Labour insiders feel their leader should also be making. Libby Vina, ITV News, Westminster. A man and woman, both aged 21, have been arrested on suspicion of murder following the death of a two-year-old boy in Dorset. Police were called to a house in the village of Broadmain this morning after the child became seriously ill. He was taken to Dorset County Hospital where he was pronounced dead. An investigation has begun. The mother of a 14-year-old girl who died after a string of failings by a priory hospital has told ITV News she finally has justice. An inquest has ruled that neglect and staff shortages contributed to the death of Amy L. Career, who took her own life. Duncan Golastani reports. For the first 14 years of her life, Amy L. Carrier was looked after by her family. With them, she was safe and happy, despite her complex mental health problems. But her mum says when she was admitted to the Priory, Amy was neglected and ultimately hung herself. Every day she was asking for one-to-one. -one. Every single day she was asking, um, I need more support, I need one-to-one. -one. It's not just the failings on the day, it's the failings throughout Amy staying there. And we can't do any more for Amy. The inquest into Amy's death revealed a series of failings. The Priory admitted a football scarf had been seen in Amy's room, but it was not taken away. On the day she died, Amy told a member of staff she wanted to kill herself. And the jury found a delay in checking on the teenager that evening significantly contributed to her death. Furthermore, staff at the hospital failed to call 999 quickly enough and were not trained in giving CPR. The Priory says it has made changes since Amy's death. We got the decision from the jury that we, we, we needed to prove that, the, that if they'd done their job, if the Priory had done their job and looked after my daughter, she would still be alive today. Her death was very avoidable. Amy's family is determined to fight for better mental health care for children. They say they will do so in Amy's name. Duncan Golostani, ITV News, Middlesex. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, why being overweight could increase the risk of prostate cancer and... Hi, my son fell in the zoo, exhibit at the gorilla. It's a setting zoo, my son fell in with the gorilla. There's a male gorilla. The emergency call made by the mother whose son fell into a gorilla enclosure. Those stories and more right after the break. Welcome back. Men with bigger waistlines were warned today that they're at greater risk of dying from prostate cancer. Scientists found the chance of developing the disease increases with every extra four inches in waist size. Our science correspondent Alok Jha reports on the deadly link with obesity. John Marshall was diagnosed with prostate cancer nine years ago. After radiotherapy treatment, it's now in check. He admits to having unhealthy eating habits when he was diagnosed. And scientists said today that being overweight might play a role in increasing a man's risk of developing prostate cancer. I only wish that I'd known this information years ago because there was a period when I was substantially overweight. Had I known that, I, I may, may have taken action earlier to reduce that weight uh, and perhaps um, a benefit from that. Obesity is known to play a role in many health problems, from heart disease to stroke and some cancers. In the new study, scientists followed more than 140,000 men over 14 years. They found that men with a waistline of 37 inches were 18% more likely to develop fatal prostate cancer than those with a waistline of 33 and a half inches. The risk of developing cancer increased as the waistlines grew. An 18% increase in risk isn't that big when you take into account your risk of prostate cancer overall. Um, so just to keep in mind, if you're noticing symptoms, go and see your GP, and anything you can do to keep a healthy, normal weight will decrease your risk of prostate cancer and other types of cancer overall. The study has not yet been assessed by other scientists, nor has it been published yet in a scientific journal. But it will point to clues about how one of the most common cancers in men might work. Alok Jha, ITV News. 
Now, in other news tonight, thousands of people have been evacuated from some areas of, around Paris after a severe flooding. Part of the metro line has been shut and so too has the Louvre Museum as the River Seine continues to rise. At least six people have died in flooding right across Europe. And the musician Prince died of an opiate overdose. That's according to reports. Investigators have been looking at whether the 57-year-old had been prescribed painkillers. The star was found dead at his home in Minneapolis back in April. The emergency call made by the mother of a boy who fell into a gorilla enclosure in the United States has been released by police. In it, the terrified woman can be heard pleading for help. The gorilla was shot dead by the zoo a short time later. Sally Lockwood has more. The heart-stopping moment, a three-year-old falls into a gorilla enclosure. The horror unfolding as the toddler's mother calls 911. My son fell in the zoo exhibit at the gorilla. It's a setting zoo. My son fell in with the gorilla. There's a male gorilla standing over him. I need someone to contact the zoo, please. Okay. Staying remarkably composed, the mother calls out to her son. Okay. Isaiah, be calm. Be calm. Be calm. She then begins to panic. Who's grabbing my son? I can't watch this. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't watch. Her frantic call was one of many from people watching the three-year-old being dragged through the enclosure. Hurry! The gorillas are out! And you slammed the baby into the wall and the baby was in the water. Listen, taking the baby. Get out. Oh, yeah. He's taking the baby into the cave. Oh, my God. The little boy was rescued when the gorilla Harambe was shot dead, an action that sparked outrage. And prosecutors are now reviewing if anyone is to blame for a toddler and an endangered animal being put at such risk. Sally Lockwood, ITV News. And finally tonight, the new £5 note was unveiled today with not only a new look but with a new feel too. They're made from polymer, uh, not paper, making them much tougher and durable. Yes, they can survive the occasional spin in the washing machine and are said to be almost impossible to tear. Well, our consumer editor Chris Troy put it to the test. Sir Winston Churchill is the new face of the fiver. At his birthplace, Blenheim Palace, the public got their first sighting and it's not just the look that's new. This note is made using flexible plastic polymer. An old one and a new one. Will you both have a look and tell me which you prefer? Definitely the new one. I like the new ones better because they're stronger and they're a lot cleaner. I've often left money in my pocket before so it won't get damaged in the machine. So, time for our consumer tests of these new fangled fibres. This new note is certainly water resistant and wipe clean. It also passed our hot coffee spill test with flying colours. The challenge is to tear the bank now. To tear it up? Tear it in half. Pull, pull. <laughs> Come on, pull. <laughs> pull in. Pull. <laughs> What's that? Uh, try that way. Blimey. I give up. <laughs> Thank you. You can fan them. But with similar currency in Canada, the public was advised to use some odd techniques to stop the notes sticking together. Ten minutes trying to tear it. This is the Bank of England governor. Isn't it a bit old-fashioned nowadays to be issuing notes? Everybody's cashless and swiping and electronic. Just under half the transactions today in Britain use cash. Do you think we'll ever uh, go so cashless? People, I, I very much doubt it, not in our lifetimes. They go into circulation in September. After 223 years, we get a new generation of the good old fiver. Chris Choi, ITV News, Blenheim Palace. Still go through them as quickly, though, I'm oh, sure. Oh, I'm sure we would, That's yeah. it for now. Raggy Omar is here at 10. Yes, that's correct. But from all of us here on the evening team, have a very good that's evening correct. yourself. Yeah. It is correct. It is correct. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>